And let's continue and hopefully finish the 15th chapter of the Mystery of the Cupboard. In the cash box, Omri finally got his cupboard and key and has opened the cash box to find three little people inside from the early night or from the early 20th and mid 20th century. Remember that this book takes place probably in the 80s, uh, the 1980s. So we have Bert the thief, Ted the cop, and Elsie the pawn shop owner. And there was also a soldier named Charlie who probably died in the Battle of Trafalgar. So he was actually from the early 19th century. And we'll pick up from where we left off last time. And he didn't come to no bad end, said Ted. He died for his country. Better love after no man than this. He took a large handkerchief out of his pocket and blew his nose loudly. Omri said cautiously, Could you tell me anything about Mrs. Driscoll? Miss Jessie, she was ever so kind, said Elsie. A real lady. We was that upset when she told us how ill she was. I think even Bert piped and I, when we said goodbye for the last time, Jenny was inconsolable. Do you know how she found out about the magic? Oh, yes, she told us that, said the policeman. You see, her son gave her a few little toy figures made of... He stopped. What was that stuff she told us else? Plastic, said Omri. That's it, new stuff, she said, and this son of hers hated it because it ruined his toy business and he lost all his money. He brought some plastic toys to show her how inferior they was to the good old tin soldiers he used to make, and she put these little toys away in the cupboard that we come in. She put them in, and she locked the door, and said to herself, That's where they belong. He won't have to see them when he comes to visit me. Not that he did come to visit us, as you'd notice, said Elsie. Not much of a son, if you ask me. Well, anyhow, went on Ted, that first time we all five, all us five, Jenny and Charlie and us three, we was all suddenly awake in the dark together. Of course, we didn't know each other. We couldn't see each other. We was just all of a sudden like there. We was a lot younger than, of course. Jenny couldn't have been more than nineteen. Bert was just a nipper. Charlie just taken the king's shilling. I'd been eight years on the force, else it was... Never you mind how old I was. And we was all scared stiff. And Charlie started hollering, and Jenny and Elsie was crying, and I was banging on the inside of the door, trying to calm everybody down, and suddenly the door opened, and there she was, staring at us, this big face. Cor, you could have knocked me over with a feather. And you could have knocked her over with one and all said Bert with a snigger. You never saw anyone so surprised in your life. Threw herself into a proper fit. Well, after we stopped having high strikes and calmed down a bit, said Elsie, we started talking and reckoning it out what had happened, and she told us this story about the cupboard and the key she locked it with. I know about that, said Omri. Yes, well bit out of the common, to say the least, but we had to believe it, because, well, because it was happening, and she made tea for us, and we drank it out of her thimble, which was like drinking it out of a barrel, but she made a good cup, I will say that, and we started to get to know each other. Can't say we turned into the best of ch Can't say we turned into the best of Chinas, said Bert, though I liked Charlie well enough, and Jenny, well, she was a dainty little piece. I could have fancied her if she'd have fancied me, but she didn't. She liked Charlie better him being in uniform and all that, but what was the use? He'd been born a hundred years too early for her. Yeah, we all had our own lives back there to worry about, said Elsie. But coming here and visiting Miss Jessie made a break like, better than a holiday in some ways. She'd feed us special food and tell us all sorts that was happening in her time, or had happened between hers and ours, though she didn't tell us everything. No, she kept the bad bits to herself. She never said a dicky bird about the Great War, for instance. When that came along, I thought Miss Jessie must have known what was in for, what we was in for. Too kind to tell us there being nothing we could do to avoid it. She was wise in her way. Omri thought he could stay here listening to his new lot of little people telling their stories forever, but soon enough, Gian and Tony would be back, and it'd be tea time.
Do you mind if I send you back now? He said. They exchanged relieved glances. That's all right, Duck, said Elsie. Can we go back through the cupboard, though, and not the little box thing? I don't like the idea of squashing into that, all of us together, said Elsie. Indecent. Okay, said Omri. He lifted them carefully one by one onto the shelf of the cupboard. Bert was the heaviest because of his stack of stolen goods. They waved to him, and Elsie blew him a kiss. Omri turned away to extract the key from the cupboard that to extract the key from the keyhole of the cash box. When he turned back, he noticed that Bert had fished something out of the sack and was showing it to Elsie. Before we part, my old else, just give this a quick butchers, he was saying. If you can resist making me an offer for this little lot, you're not a dealer. You're not the dealer I take you for. Now don't tempt me, you bad boy, she was saying. Who do you think I am, Fagin? Oh, look, Ted, aren't they lovely? She and Ted both bent irresistibly over what Bert held in his hand. It looked like a tiny box. Lovely red leather, said Elsie, admiringly stroking it. Italian these are. I've seen them before. Lovely. But it's what's inside that counts, gloated Bert. Go on, Else. Have a look. A look won't hurt. I think we ought to be getting back, put in the policeman uncomfortably. But a strange and impossible idea had come into Omri's mind. Let me see that, Mr. Martin, he said. He reached into his desk and found his brand new magnifying glass that he'd got for his birthday, for his stamps. Leveling it in the slanting rays of the sun, he saw the jewel case open into two layers of trays on minute hinges. Displayed before him was a collection of minuscule items of jewelry, by screwing up his eyes and getting the magnifying glass focused just at the right distance, he could make out what they were. Among them were a pearl necklace, two gold lockets, an emerald bracelet, and a diamond pin. And that is the end of chapter 15.